Check mic, check mic. One, two, one, two. Welcome to episode 17. Yeah, it's better now. It's better. Okay. Episode 17. Amazing, isn't it, that we've got this far? I never, would, never would have thought it, would you? I wouldn't have thought we had 17 podcasts down a year after starting. It's I, astonishing. I didn't think we'd have it in us, to be honest yeah. with you. I thought it would have been cancelled well yeah. before now. Well, I, I, I never thought we had that level of longevity. No. Can I start now? You may start. Thank you. Welcome to episode 17 of the Author Hub C1D1 podcast, aka the Pete Bate Show. <laughs> Please leave us a, late, a rating and a review if you're listening to this podcast. And if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, Fabio, if you can just run the graphic here. Please, uh, can you hit the like button? For the love of God, hit the like button. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications. There, I said I'd Great. do it. Awesome. So, Pete, what do you think of our new kit? What happens if they actually press, press the subscribe button? Do that take them out into a new window? A whole no, no, new they thing? stay where they are. They stay get a notification, as you would have seen in that graphic there. Yeah. And then basically, when the new video content comes up, they get notified immediately. Okay. And how much cool stuff is there but coming? But it doesn't drag them off to a screen where they have to like fill out their no, name no, and address it's, it's and all that. it's instant. Right. It's automatic. Okay. All right, fine. <laughs> the fair of technology. What is all this new kit in front of me? I, I'm so baffled. All this, these cables. It's like so, a, it's like you know that pit that um, uh, Indiana Jones fell into, mm. with, full of snakes. They Raiders of the Lost Ark. Boom. Mm. It's a snakes. Bit, it's a bit Why like, does it always have to I be hate, snakes? I, I, I hate snakes. So we had that issue slightly with Tom Quick's audio last time. We did, and uh, we can only apologise for that. And so as a result of that, we spent a shitload of money. And we've got all this kit. <laughs> I'm sure it'll never happen again. But the best thing is now that look at this. <laughs> oh, do you hear that? It's like being. Let me let's let's try. Another it's like one. being on regional radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Oh. So I've now got all this cool stuff. So this is what I do now. And then I've got one for you as well, Pete. Here you go. <laughs> like Westwood. So, um, it's like being on Radio Kent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who are you calling a Kent? So, our guest today is Lisa Hadfield Law, who, like Judge Dredd, she is the law. So, Lisa's also one of those people who's only ever is not known by their first name. It's, it's yes. always Lisa Hadfield Law. Yes, yeah, right. it's, it's it's all said as one thing. That's one absolutely thing. true. Yeah, you are Lisa Hadfield Law. Very rarely do people call you Lisa. I, I think I feel fortunate enough, perhaps I could call you Lisa now. Honestly, far away. So Lisa Hadfield Law has spent more than 20 years in clinical practice. She managed a trauma and orthopedic service in a major teaching hospital and has significant insight into the challenges facing surgical teams, as well as some of the challenging behaviours. What? <laughs> and situations Looking that can arise. Looking at me? Yeah. Uh, Lisa was voted Nurse of the Year. I never knew that. Nurse of the year. Nurse of the year. Yep. What, Nurse of, of the year, nineteen oh two. We we don't we don't O two. We'll go with O two. Uh, by the Royal College of Nursing in the Department of Health, was the head of nursing at Bart's for five years. God's own. And head then of a, nursing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, for five years. What was it like being a nurse? Wait, wait hang on. We'll, we'll, we'll come oh. to that in a minute. We'll come back to that. And then, and um, let me give her her credits first. I've got a bio. All right, all right. And then she was an emergency service director. Where was that? John Radcliffe in Oxford. Oh, Oxford, actually. Um, and she has a master's in higher professional education and is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Educators. i have really got to put my application in, haven't I? I think so, yes. I'm surprised you've waited this long. Yeah, I've got a Pete. I've been doing all this. Yeah. I've been babysitting Pete Bates. For <laughs> so Lisa Hadfield-Law has been a surgical educator since 1992. In that time, she's trained over 15,000 surgeons from 68 countries within Europe, North America, Latin America and Asia Pacific. She's spent nigh on 30 years as a medical education consultant and works with mainly orthopedic, but cardiothoracic and neurosurgical specialties as well. Have I missed anyone out? No, most surgical specialties okay. in some shape or form. And over 25 years with AO Trauma, AO Spine and AO Vet. And a decade as the education advisor to the British Orthopedic Association and the Royal College of Surgeons. Lisa is also on the, sorry, Lisa Hadfield Law, is also <laughs> on the advisory board to the Faculty of Surgical <laughs> Trainers and she was awarded the BOA Presidential Merit Award in 2018. That's impressive. It is impressive. When people introduce me, it never goes on for as long as that. It's still going. And having been immersed in both cultures, she's in a unique position to provide educational advice to surgeons. Uh, I think it's fair to say we really value Lisa's feedback and encouragement when we've been starting this Author Hub thing. Yeah. Um, so Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Pleased Lisa. to be here. Is that okay? Yeah. Listen, I'd just like to apologise at the outset for any bad language. Please, because 
if you do loads of effing and jeffing, I can't let my mum yeah. listen. So. I'd like to apologise, but Lisa's got a filthy mouth. <laughs> <laughs> She's like a truck driver. <laughs> you know? Have you she... ever heard me F and Jeff? You taught me all the bad swear words. It's like being at the truck stop, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Pete, we've got our work out today because Lisa is a bona fide surgical educationalist. She is. Uh, I think this is where we get found out and exposed. It's all over after this. <laughs> um, just before we start, to um, on a serious note, um, I just wanted to take this time to pay a tribute to Professor Nigel Stanfield. Um, it seems very apt given that we're doing this session on education mm. and training. So uh, Professor Stanfield, he was kind of, um, you know, passed away last week at the age of 69, which is no age at all, really. Yeah. He was a professor of uh, vascular surgery and surgical education. He was my pr training program director when I was a junior doctor. Um, he supervised my MD. I did my fellowship with him in medical education, uh, leadership and management at the deanery. And he got me, he helped sort out my consultant job. So I owe him my career. Yeah. I wouldn't be here without him. So, and the thing is, he was, a f he was really ferocious <clears throat> at fighting for the rights of trainees and he salvaged many careers. I mean, you, you knew him, Lisa. I absolutely did. And uh, my abiding memory is somebody who was absolutely and totally batting for trainees mm. and stepped up to the plate every time. You know, I put it out on Twitter when, when, when unfortunately, when he passed away and the number of hundreds, if not thousands of people got in touch and were kind of sharing stories about, and they weren't even surgeons. They were kind of just how it had such a significant impact on their careers. Um, it was a significant impact and his le legacy will live long. Um, although they did tell me not to do my master's in surgical education. <laughs> we had a big ding dong about that. <laughs> and then I told you, so, and then um, he said, don't do that, do something else. And then uh, in my second year of the master's, I turned up and he was sitting there. So I assumed he'd come to give the talk. And then he gave the budge up and sat next to me and started making notes. And I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm on the course. And I said, I thought you told me not to do this. So India, he ended up doing the master's as well with as me. As well. <laughs> so um, it was uh, no, good times, good times. You get quite choked up over there, old boy. He he really took um, a care and an interest in my career when not many did. And so I genuinely do owe him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Beautiful story. Beautiful story. Um, <clears throat> transition. Pete. Play some music or something. Give us a sound effect. Well, it doesn't really seem... Okay. <laughs> oh, no. That's the wrong sound effect. I'll, I'll, I'll edit that out. I'll edit that out. Um... <laughs> He would laugh. <laughs> he would laugh. <laughs> That's it's, it's a sad trombone. So I thought it was like a sad. I didn't realize it was going to be. Oh. Okay. Um, Lisa, 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 over to you. Tell us how you. What was it like being a nurse back in the olden days? Oh, do you know what? I loved it. Although, to be honest. Did you, you used to wear a hat, right? Yeah. So it was a big, tall hat at bar. So it went about, oh, I don't know, at nine inches in the air and then flowed down my back. But we had to make them out of a square of starch cotton. So I only ever made about once every 18 months. So I don't think it was terribly clean. No, nowadays that just wouldn't wash, would it? <laughs> and and uh, what was it like? Was it, were they, those are glorious years? They were glorious years, but you know, like anybody in their twenties and thirties, of course they're glorious years, but they were different when yeah. I watch uh, clinical staff now life is very different for them yeah what i loved was a huge sense of belonging uh, a sense of certainly at barts a sense of history and i loved that but it was different not yeah. better not worse just different do you look at nursing now and think uh, i don't I, I i i would still do this i i wouldn't do this I, i'd still happily be a head of nursing now i i would never be appointed as head of nursing now i i don't think i have the capacity now i think it takes a very different kind of person um and i i absolutely having certainly watched this last year i take my hat off to them i think they are absolutely amazing and do an amazing job but i have nightmares about in, in my nightmares i'm back nursing yeah i don't think i could have that's, it that's your imposter syndrome isn't it a mm, little bit yeah. <laughs> i'll come back to that more and more about that later yeah i mean uh cash and i saw some of the some of the icu nurses that they, they are over, over this last year or so they have been so impressive it's hard to put it into words 
And not just ICU nurses, but ward nurses, community nurses, practice nurses. Yeah, yeah. right. And a lot of the theatre nurses were, you know, redeployed to ITU. Yeah, and unbelievably. So, yeah. The, yeah. the pressure on the nursing staff over the last year has just been unreal and immense. Yeah. Agreed. For, well, for actually, for all, all clinicians who were redeployed into somewhere unexpected, unfamiliar, I think we are very, very lucky to yeah. have been able to uh, to 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 have that. Particularly, it, well, actually, everywhere in the world, I think, in a lot of ways. Gosh, this is a so- another sound effect. Quick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <This is fun. laughs> that's more like it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Lisa, how did you get into how did you get into education? What, what, why why transition from nurse to education? Oh, it was it was pure serendipity. So I've been involved in ATLS right from the start, from when it came to this country. We were doing an ATLS uh, instructors course, and I had been involved in setting up the nursing half of that. Um, and something happened to the educator, and so at two fifteen, and we were due to start at six. I had a call and the course chairman said, can you um, can you be the educator? He said, because you're best at play acting and uh, we haven't really got anyone else. So, oh, OK, all right. Perhaps rather stupidly, but that's how it happened. And you felt you had an aptitude for it right off the bat? Uh, it's Listen, it's a set of skills. Uh, I was interested in teaching. I'd done quite a lot. I went on to do a master's in education. It's a learned skill. Looking back, do you feel that um, back when you started as an educationalist, educationalism as a, as a specialty, if you like, wasn't particularly well developed? People, it wasn't much of a science. People were, weren't very good at it. Is that is that fair to say, or is that not no, fair think, to say? I think there were loads of people who were really good at it, but I don't think there was much science behind it. I don't think there was much thought. There was a feeling that if you've done something for quite a long time, you'd be able to teach it, but as you know, with surgery, just because I've been to a lot of operations, you wouldn't really want me to do your knee replacement, would you? So with with education, we know a lot more about how learning works and that's been applied to medical education. So I think quite a lot of progress has been made instead of just leaving it to amateur, enthusiastic, in, amateur enthusiasts. But did you at the time, do you recall looking back did you feel that there was a, a space like a this is a th- no. is a void this is a thing that's unexplored and no. an open territory that I can walk into and make and make an impact no. in that makes me sound like a pioneer no i've been exposed to some pretty impressive medical educationalists about 30 years ago and was just interested and um enthusiastic about it yeah. i i didn't it wasn't me carving out a niche i can tell you that much yeah and what just for those wondering why we've got an educationalist onto Author Hub? What 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 is the role of an educationalist in surgery? I mean, that, that sounds like a stupid question, but just answer it on face value. Well, as I said, if you if you think about it, you don't just have people hanging around being surgeons and 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 sort of just just acquiring stuff by osmosis. If you're going to learn to be really good at something. You've got to take some kind of structured approach. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to really get decent practice going. And as I said, we've got principles now. We know how people learn. And and so using that to quicker the, the, the learning curve, if you like, is going to be really important. And which are the easier things to teach people? Is it the, the harder, so- like the technical stuff, how to put a suture in, how to like fix a bone, how to put a screw in, or is it the softer stuff, uh, conflict resolution, well, how you to give tell feedback? Me. You tell me which is easier. I, I, I would say the softer stuff is much more difficult to, to, to teach. And well, why do you think that is? Uh, because you're dealing with people's, it's, it's not uh, didactic, uh, here's, here's the, step one step two step three step four people have to have to have a feel for it and they have to uh you you've, you've got to have some empathy with the person you're speaking to well it's not black and white is it yeah so if you you've got um a certain number of knee replacements you can use you know really fairly black and whitely when people need a knee replacement or when their pelvis needs uh mending but of course the, the glue that holds all that together, the softer skills, the judgment is not black and white. 
Yeah. And so I think that makes it very difficult for people who are used to seeing the world in a fairly black and white way. Yeah. Makes it difficult. Yep. I think you're being slightly, um, uh, you're doing yourself down there a bit because we, we run a non-technical skills course um, in the simulation, simulated theatre. And actually, Pete really gets into that. He's really good at that, actually. Um, he's pretty, he's not very good at most things, but <laughs> that he he does really well. And I, and I kind of stand back and Cheers, Cash. Off Cheers Cash. I don't get yeah. many compliments on this podcast. No, it's your birthday, it's isn't usually it? Usually abuse. Or it's your birthday, like, that's I, right. I'm something out of a Goonies or something like that. <laughs> would, would, Chloe got really picture. upset about that. Did I can't really? believe, I can't believe you let Cash do that. I will never do that to you again. Okay. Uh, I'll never do that to you again. Um, but no, there's an image coming up right now, isn't it? I can just see it now. I can see it now. I've, pl- I've planned it already. I've planned it already. <laughs> so, um, but no, the, I, I'm glad. Well, I thought you were about to get into some sort of deeper, meaningful kind of educational theory dis- conversation there. I thought you were going to ask about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. <laughs> oh, Carl was experiential learning cycle. Ow. Is that where you want to go? Because that's all I've got. I do not. <laughs> have... <laughs> um, Lisa, are you an apology? Um, uh, I first came across you at the BOA in 2012 when you were chairing a session. On simulation. On simulation. Yes. And I was at the back of the room and I was doing my MD at the time in simulation. And there was a part of me and I was certainly a bit immature. I'm more mature now, as you can see. Um, mm. That thought, why is... Still pretty immature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've really grown up. No, there's a part of me, if I'm honest, that said at the time, why is this person who's not a surgeon telling us mm. how we should train and learn and practice? Um, I've never said this to you before, and I'm slightly embarrassed to say it now, but I've, you know, I've come to really value and cherish your guidance and support over the years, ser- seriously. Um, but I imagine that you've had this kind of conversation or you've heard this kind of thing from other people who are probably less tactful than me. It, it, I, I suspect it's been something that people have thought rather than said out loud. One or two have, and, mm. I, and, and actually that's part of the reason I did a master's in education because somebody said exactly that. Right. In some ways it's easier for me as an educationalist because at least I have been in clinical practice. Yeah. And so that, that has made it easier. But I, I don't think I tell anybody what to do. I uh, can talk about theories i can talk about how to turn theory into practice but i'm not i'm not overly brilliant i'm not absolutely in the know about every aspect but i have got fairly useful ways of helping surgeons learn how to learn and learn how to teach but i can't force myself on anyone you're quite right no but we've seen that the boa the ao um you know i think that um we everyone values your role but do you find, have you found over the years having to, have you had that feeling of having to prove yourself over, because you're, you know, let's let's put it out there. You're a nurse uh, teaching education to doctor surgeons who are pretty pleased with themselves and uh, <clears throat> maybe, uh, you know, if you were a surgeon yourself, they would perhaps have, uh, you know, give you more respect right off the bat. I don't know, Is am I? It's it's interesting because I've been over the last um, decade trying to help surgeons learn how to take my role on. And interestingly, surgeons have been less receptive to that and have been more resistant. So maybe it goes back to this business of change. Nobody really loves changing. They want to carry on doing what they're doing. They, They don't want to have an extra thing to think about. So maybe they're resistant to change rather than resistant to somebody or something they've got to say. But what I've what I've learned is that I, what I do does not define me. I am not a nurse anymore. I did nursing once and I loved it, but I did nursing once. I do education now. I'm not sure I call myself an educationalist. We certainly do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think. No, 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 that was... Royal yeah. College do, the BOA Robert, do, the AO do, yeah. every, everyone else seems to think But as are. my husband says, everybody has a shelf life. It doesn't go on forever. Mm. At the moment, I've got some useful things for some people. But it won't last and there'll be somebody else and then I'll have to do something else and I won't be an educationalist anymore. Well, earlier on... Uh, we, uh, Lisa and I were doing the the uh, talk about, the yeah. author her bite size, and she was uh, the name still being worked. Is on. it bite size? No, it, or, or, we or liked her... we liked Bates bites. 
<coughs> ortho bites yeah. ortho bites yeah. anyway but uh, guys if anyone has any ideas just can you leave leave it in the comments below <laughs> can can they did they get a prize they get a prize if we use your name you will get a prize you will get uh, some it, author hub merch it some might oh. look like an author hub mug <laughs> actually we have we've only got one bit of author pot, author author hub merch between us all now so no, we can't give it away no there's loads coming there's loads, Is coming. There loads? yeah there's like a lorry there's a lorry load it's just we're just it's being stitched up in bangladesh as we speak <laughs> Like we're on prime. a budget. We're on a budget. <laughs> so I want you to think about a time when you got some feedback and it stung, but it was really useful. Uh, the, the, there were two times. <clears throat> I did a um, undergraduate degree, a BSc, when I was, you know, an inter intercalated degree as uh, part of medical school. And part of that was a research project. At the end of the project, <clears throat> we had to give a presentation. So before the presentation, we had a mock presentation and I was still at a time of life where uh, I was pretty carefree and we'd, I'd done the work, but I kind of... Actually, I've got some photos of you as the Tango Man. <laughs> I'll put that up there here. Are, there I... are a lot of photos. Can I put that in there now? Are some crazy... <laughs> <laughs> John Simmons kindly has yeah, yeah, some yeah. pictures. Um, and I, get, I, I was presenting my, my, my work but I, I chucked in a load of like silly slides, like some Peter Rabbit slides and some, some real silly stuff. And at the end of it, when everyone was in, all, all the students thought it was absolutely hilarious and, and the faculty was sort of smiling, but like wincing at the same time. And at the end, the professor came up to me, gave an absolute rollicking, said, you know, this is, you know, it was very, very funny. And I, I you're, you've got a great sense of humor and it was very funny. And even I was laughing, but the fact of the matter is, is that you had scientific data there and you cheapened it by 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 just making every by turning it into the pete bates show and you can't do that when you're doing uh, presenting scientific data it's great being a comedian and i i commend your you know what you what you're able to do but you mustn't do it in this setting mm -hmm. and and that really because he wasn't angry with me he, but, he was actually yeah. smiling as he said it but you know he was said it quite warmly but it was poignant because basically said if you did that in the final you will definitely fail and then you've Definitely. just ignored him and dicked around for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> is that basically the, is that the learning point here? Yeah. And the second time was when, was when Lisa Hadfield Law gave me my first ever feedback. Lisa the first Hadfield time Law. I'd ever met her in my entire life. Mm. This woman comes up to me and starts telling me, so would you like your feedback now or later? And I'm like, who, who I'm not the, sure I want who? it ever. <laughs> yeah, right. I know I was good. <laughs> was that on the pelvic course? I can't know. If, I can't even remember when it was. It was on the perfect course with Martin Bircher. Yeah, I think it probably was. And uh, again, I'd, I'd kind of done that thing that I'd done like, like 15 or 20 years but previously, like turning it into the me show. And she had some quite, st not stinging comments, but actually you said, you know, it was basically the same conversation. It was basically the same same conversation. So like, you know, <clears throat> it's amazing you can hold a room in the way you do. But actually a lot of the showmanship that goes in detracted from the message. And actually it put off some of your co-speakers as well. You actually detracted from their message as well because you tried to own the whole thing. And uh, and actually that was quite, it was, it was, it wasn't a stinging rebuke. You gave the feedback extremely well. But I went from thinking, who the effing hell is this woman t t giving me feedback to literally within three minutes going, oh, my God, you're absolutely right. How yeah. do you get that right now? How do you use your humour and your quickness to engage people? I think he doesn't. I think he just dicks about still. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it goes... I think he meant that really supportively. Yeah, no, he, did, <laughs> yeah. No, he did. He did. That was that was positive feedback. That was, that's that was, he's very me. good at very difficult conversations. He's very is good he? at like, like passing on the bad news. There was no bullying, undermining <laughs> and harassment there. No siree, no. <laughs> Answer the question. <laughs> And the answer is I've I've just changed the way that I, I do I do presentations I, I do lectures presentations teaching sessions I now don't start with me and the show I start with what's the message and I work backwards I and that's what we were talking about in our in our bite earlier on and maybe that's what really great education and really good teachers do is focus on what's going to help whoever's learning and resist the temptation to show people how great you are. And I think that's really hard. And particularly if I'm feeling a bit anxious, a bit old, a bit over the hill, I'll go into, right, what can I say now that will impress? That I'm not doing it consciously, but I have to really consciously go stop with that. Stop with that. Well, yeah. 
Pete gave a you gave a talk at the pot meeting in 2015 on nailing distal tibial fractures. Yeah, which was um, the topic of our second podcast, and actually it was that presentation made me change my presentation style, um, particularly because there was one very clear take home message, and the whole thing, the whole talk built up to that one point. And that point I remember to this day. Every time I do this, anyone's doing a nailing, I walk into theatre, I go, all right. Just go lateral to the midpoint. You know? <laughs> but it, so, yeah. so is that how you do it? That's it. So you start with the message. You start with the golden nugget. You start with the, or, or the two or three golden nuggets in that topic. And you've got to distill down what those are. You can't have 15. You've got to have two or three. And everything in your talk prior to that has to in some way build to one of those three otherwise it's extraneous if it's something something else or it's it's look at my awesome fixation or uh you know what what it, it's got to build build to that point actually we were talking about andy williams earlier and that is one of the things he does brilliantly is he shares his dirty laundry yeah. He shares he he shares not cases that ooh look at me. He shares cases this didn't go so well. This is why and this is what I do next time. So so as an aside he does that more than anyone I know. Me too. So we'll we'll be in an MDT or he'll be on a stage at Basque or Esca or and he'll go let me show you some cases that didn't work out. And he's a phenomenal surgeon. And I kind of like and I just don't know how he has how he does it because if if i had you know if I, anything i've got i don't want anyone to know about it and yeah he's gonna oh, actually bring up that one look the, look what can happen here and do that and honestly the level of um uh you know insight and uh comfort in your skills that that takes is well beyond me at the moment i wonder whether it's as basic as courage yeah. He has the courage to deal with the fallout and risk people going, ooh, I can't believe he's done that. But that has resulted in a generation of surgeons who recognise that you cannot be flawless all the time. No. Well, if he can do it, it can happen to anyone. And so there's an element of that. And also there's an element of, look what can happen, so try and avoid this. Mm. So there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's learning from your own mistakes. And if you can learn from, not mistakes, but something that hasn't gone optimally for somebody else, then that's... The second best place. It's 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 essential, and you the best and place. I have colleagues who cannot do that. The surgical glitterati amongst us, and there are many abroad too, who are bringing up the next generation to believe that uh, you're striving for perfection, and if you don't find it, you don't get it, you sweep it under the carpet, and that's dangerous. Agreed. Yeah, and that's why um, reflection is really really important. I think. And that's the only downside of the the kind of and I'm not not taking uh, having pops at anyone in particular here. I I just think that is sometimes the danger of putting up cases on on Twitter and Instagram etc. Uh, putting up cases that went really well and saying this is the exemplar way of doing things. Uh, it, it's great to see an operation done really nicely because you it gives you a template for what a, a good operation looks like. But actually, we do learn a lot from complications and uh, uh, operations that don't go so well through no one's fault. Um, and so uh, I love it when uh, I love it when Yelena puts up a, a, a Yelena Bogdan. Yeah. yeah, when she puts up a, a case that didn't go so well, which had to be revised or which 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 wasn't. You or, know. Or, or sometimes it's just there's an intraoperative correction of something. That's I've it. replaced my guide wire. Or, that's it. But, or there's a tip. But there's always a tip and a trick. That's a great learning point. That's it. Would I wonder whether there's a way then of making social media, whether it's Twitter or Instagram, safe enough for people to do that? Because what's worrying me is it's it's such a fabulous medium. It can have such great reach. It's so accessible. But people behave so shittily yeah. on there. No, it, it can be toxic, can't it? No, no it, I, it not just can be. It sort of usually is. And I see so many instances of somebody posting something well meant, sometimes a bit naive, sometimes not correct. Absolutely. And people are all of fury. over it. Yeah. All yeah. over it. And in a terribly, terribly insulting way. I saw somebody the weekend before last say something naive, and it was naive, but it was well meant. And it's somebody outside our world. Just... Within Phew. an hour and a half, there were two, two, 200 that, that ended up with fuck off fuck off more and fuck off even more what 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 use is that 
Yeah. What encouragement is that wow. for anyone That's to pretty special. speak That's up? Yeah. So, so the, obviously the challenge there is about um, it, it. it's an open source platform with anyone on there. And it comes down to learning environment. What does a good learning environment look like? So let's let's talk about an orthopedic department. What does a good learning environment look like in, in your eyes? I don't think people can learn unless there is a trusting environment. I think they can sort of tolerate loads of other really hard things. But if they can't trust the people they work with, they're not going to get anywhere. That's really, really toxic. So what I suppose we're all aiming for, whether it's an orthopedic... A unit or just a two-day course or just a, an interaction with a medical student in clinic is finding that sweet spot between challenging somebody or people and supporting them so and, not and not, not making them look ridiculous absolutely feeling feeling shame feeling stupid is unbelievably toxic to learning so that that is never going to work no matter what happened in my day that doesn't work and we know that so so looking for making it challenging enough and supportive enough not so that everyone's holding hands and singing kumbaya and feeling feeling very very relaxed learning isn't comfy and it isn't relaxed I, and i think i've i've been thinking about this and i th and it just summer i agree entirely what you're saying it basically needs to be an ethos of trust respect and mutual challenge yeah 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 i think it's going to be two-way the challenge absolutely and and i suppose it's as fundamental as treating each other as grown-ups so start with the referring to somebody more senior as the boss or trainees as the kids these kids in inverted commas have often had other careers before their parents they've got mortgages they are grown-up people yeah so and in time, they, they, in many respects, they will surpass you. They will be, you know, they will be uh, considerably more successful in their field than you are I currently so. in yours. I hope so, Pete, because isn't that what we're bringing the next generation up to do? That's to the whole be point. better than us, right. yeah. To solve the problems that we couldn't solve and do the things we couldn't do. So, yeah. So how do I, as a, as a, as, as a boss, garner this environment of trust? How do I generate that? Oh, I think that's so hard, isn't it? And what I will say is that if you compromise, if you just think, oh, I'll just sip and I'll just do that quickly, I'll just make that little snipe and have a bit of a laugh, or just say that slightly undermining thing behind a colleague's back, once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. It's so difficult to get back. So it, you have to be constantly on your guard to protect that trust, respect, and caring for each other. Bit of discipline. Yeah, d but d discipline as in not like discipline a dog or a donkey or even a child, but self-discipline yeah. and just, yeah, dancing to the same tune. And so to flip it over, what does a bad learning environment look like? What does what what are the what are the hallmarks, the the commonest pitfalls you come across of seeing people doing things badly? In a learning environment. Yeah. No trust, no respect. The inverse of it all, basically. Individuals out for their own self-promotion rather than the good of the whole unit. You know, if we were working together now. And we were running uh, a, 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 the the training program for, say, your program, uh, Cash. Really thinking about what is right for our group of trainees, not what do I fancy or what do I like doing or when do I like working or what suits me most. No, what do our trainees need? And focusing on that. There is a thing, though, isn't there, that people sometimes think this was good for me. I grew up with this. Mm -hmm. I came through that well. I, ref I look back on that fondly and I believe that that was a good thing. Yeah. And and therefore, uh, uh, it kind of made me the person I am today, that kind of, that kind of phrase. How, and when, how, well, when you said to me at the start, what was it like in the back in the day? And I said, it was fabulous in so many ways and I loved it. But just because I loved it, doesn't mean that it was right or good or the best. One of the traps we all fall into as teachers is we teach the way we were taught. Yeah. 
And so we will, particularly if, even when we know better, if we're tired or under pressure or unsure, we'll revert back to old ways that we know don't, don't really work anymore. Yeah. Can I ask you about feedback? Mm. So feedback, um, classically, well, I want to know how we can make it useful and actionable. Because classically, we were brought up, when I was at med school, it was about Pend- Pendleton's rules, mm. which was, do you know that, Pete? It was a, it was a thing yeah. that went, what went well? What could you have done better? And, and every single time it was, well, I, I could have, uh, what went well? I introduced myself, yeah. you know, and what, what could you have done better? And then it was, it was painful. And then, and the other classic thing that we see that you refer to a fair bit is the shit sandwich. Yeah. You know, this was really, really terrible. This bit's a bit better. This was terrible. No, it's the other, the other way around. This was, this was awesome. <laughs> I'm used to hearing it from Pete. I get nothing but abuse. I, the, so the, the, the ratio of shit to yeah, it's right. it's praise from you, from you is two to one. It's a bread smeared in the middle. <laughs> yeah, like Nutella. It's just a Nutella sandwich. Yeah. Um, so it is something good. This was absolutely terrible. This is what I really wanted to say. And then this is something at the end just to make us both feel a little bit better about it. And let's just move on. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, I got that in the end. All right, so anything formulaic won't really work. Now, if we go back to pre-Pendleton, so the 1980s, one of our trainers, and he'll know who he is, went to the uh, coffee room door to give feedback to a trainee who everybody knew had been struggling. And he went, see these, they don't work, and went off again. Now, clearly... As we've said, anything that leads... So if anyone listened, Lisa was just showing us her, her hands. Because <laughs> some people are just listening. Oh, thank Not you. Yeah, yeah. Or for anybody who's audio. blind. Yeah. Yes, thank you yeah. for that. That's, that's lovely. Um, Lisa's wearing a very nice red jacket. Um, it's orange. Anyone... It's burnt orange, this. Burnt, burnt orange. orange. I'm so sorry. So uncaring. Um, so <laughs> that clearly is not okay. Because as we said earlier, leaving learners feeling shame is just toxic they end up worse than they were so pendleton at least gave a bit of structure and at least got people to think about the things they were doing well because with the old way and all the criticism so often individuals would leak out all their good stuff they were so focused on sorting out the things that needed to be better that they lost sight of the things they were good at so that was awful so pendleton came in and addressed that we had to really think about uh, what we're good at we had to get learners to verbalize first and that's a good thing to do because if you ask them first they get into the habit of self-regulating, which is really important as a professional. You have to be able to know where your boundaries are, not have to rely on somebody else to do that. Uh, it means that you as a teacher can assess their insight. If they've been awful and say, uh, yeah, I didn't think that went too badly, then you, ooh, you've got your work cut out. If they've been great, and, and but they say, oh my, that was terrible. I'm just gonna have to give up then you've got your work cut out in a different way. So asking them first to articulate their own self-assessment is important. But let's move away from formulaic. What we really need to be aiming for is a conversation, a conversation around performance that is really clear, really clear and really candid but coming from a good place, coming from a kind place, coming from a sensitive place, batting for your trainee. I just find that as a you know training or residency program director myself, and I look at people's feedback, um, a lot of it is quite superficial and glib at times. Yeah. And, it, and you look at it and you think, how is this going to help this person improve? Mm-hmm. And so I'm still you know looking out for ways to to make it actionable something that's actually going to make a change do you i wonder whether it's examples i i think feedback without examples isn't really feedback so you know if if i just said to pete oh you know pete you're a really good teacher or uh pete i think you've got some work to do with your teaching maybe read around it a bit more that's no use mm. yeah if i can give ex- really clear examples of why i think something was good Um, on why I think work needs to be done. Those examples are really powerful. So what I try to do now is if I'm working with anybody, I try to constantly be just making a note. If I see something either brilliant, really impressive, or something I'm worried about, 
I really work hard to put words around that, not judge it, but put words around it. So, so for example, um, if I were giving your feedback again, or we were discussing that again, yeah. instead of just reeling off a whole list of things I thought weren't terribly good or were good, I'd ask you first to see what you thought, and then I could judge where I come in with the with the highest impact things, the most important things. But they would be examples. Yeah. So I have I, my my examples. I will try and give as 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 quickly as I can. So, for instance, I know Tom Quick was on. A, I listened to his uh, podcast with you, which I absolutely loved. You and sat what, in your very chair. Well, I loved it and I don't have anything to do with nerves, but I thought it was absolutely masterful because he makes hard things accessible. He speaks to others as though he wants them to be able to do what he can do, not I'm doing something so special. You ask me if you need anything like that doing. Um, And he's passionate about what he does. Now, I'm not interested in nerves, but I listened right to the end. No, and we learned stuff as well. We yeah, I, was, I, was I like, finally understand what a schwann cell is. Cash's it? mouth was agog for most that of that. Amazing, but <laughs> you, you, I hope, I hope you put in writing to him what it was he did well, um, because that he can do something with. If he knows he's really good at that, he can look for opportunities to do it more. So rather than just emailing him afterwards, which I'm sure you did, and said, "Oh, Smash, amazing!" Smashed it, mate. That's a lovely feeling, but tell him what, what, what he did, giving examples. So maybe if we all look <clears throat> for examples all the time of yays or... Ooh. Lisa, if I slip you a fiver, could you do that for us? What? Write his feedback. For yeah, us. Like, I've yeah. already done it. I wrote to him. I did. I wrote to him two days later. It was Great. on his birthday. Oh, there yeah. are Beautiful. Some, there Beautiful. are some people who don't take feedback well. Uh, not, not, not many. I think I've had two. I can see them in my mind's eye now. I have had two people when I said, I've, uh, "Do you want a bit of feedback?" Yeah. Two. One. One of them. One of them. Um, I had my bit of paper, and he took the bit of paper, screwed it up, and threw it on the floor, and looked okay. at me and walked off. The other one went, "No, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of older people. Um, Pete's their, it's, spo- it's, Pete's their yeah. spokesman. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the old people. <laughs> oh, that's, that is me. How do you tell someone who really is terribly, terribly senior that they, that they, they really could do better than this? Well, is that an easy you discussion? Def- is it harder discussion to have someone who is really well established and senior? Is it a different conversation? No, as long as it's coming from a good place and as long as the, 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 the feedback is welcome and they want it. And let's face it, most people want to be better than they are, no matter how brilliant they are. And again, if we use Andy, Andy is always open to feedback, absolutely always. We did some, uh, Chris Colton wrote an article last week that was great and there were suggestions I had for him and he was very happy to take that but he knows it's coming from a good place and he has the choice he, yeah. it's, it, the feedback does, is not the sort of be all and end all just because I say it doesn't make it right Yeah. so as long as it is given or discussed coming from a place where you are batting for somebody else and you want them to be great and understanding that just because you've said it doesn't make it right it is a point of view and it's hopefully of interest to them but they have a choice about whether they act on it so I think if you're coming from that point of view as I said there's only ever been two who said no thanks and are you giving people a list of things to do are you saying these are the bullet points of things you should do in this order or I've, I've shifted a bit and I think I did in the early days do quite a lot here's here's a list of things you could do and here's a list of things that are great and I, I think that was really about me sort of proving myself and, and, and showing them how worthy my contribution was. Mm. Now I think I'm better at understanding that if feedback's to be useful, it really needs to be titrated by them. So I don't give a list, but we have conversations now. But you and, do have a list in your head, right? Yeah. You've, you've yeah, got a list in your yeah, head yeah. and your hope, your 
as part of the conversation, you're almost hoping that they give you that list. No, I don't. I, I, do, I really try to avoid. I'm hoping you'll guess what's in my mind if I have a serious look on my face and I say, what did you think about? Mm, yeah. And see if they'll say it. No, I don't. You know from breaking bad news to patients, that's not okay. You, you, it's about being candid but sensitive. So I won't beat around the bush. I won't, I won't do shit sandwiches with, you know, I'll, I'll say something nice, well done for breathing, but here we are with the not so good. But I will ask quite focused questions and I will usually start with, what, what were you wanting to do? What was your aim? So if they're doing something, whether it's around leadership or teaching, what was your aim? What do you think happened? What was the difference? And so we're really looking, trying to identify very early on what they want to do to get to the next level. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I'll often have bits of advice, a few suggestions, but I, t I try not to go in now with telling people because it's not right. Tell us about the trainee in difficulty. We're not supposed to call that's a term. You isn't can't it? call not, it that anymore. Can't call it that anymore. No. What's it called? It's really hard, isn't it? It's, uh, I spoke to my colleague Doreen at West Midlands yesterday from the uh, PSW. Um, I don't even know what that stands for. Professional support or something. And now we are referring to trainees in difficulty as trainees with additional needs because that's probably right, you know. Many of our trainees have got difficulties because of circumstances, personal circumstances, or they're in units that are not suitable for them. Yeah. So uh, to to make to call them trainees or difficult trainees is not accurate. That then was trainees in difficulty, but trainees with additional needs is you could argue it's all very politically cor correct. But actually, it's probably quite a useful way of looking at so it. So, what can trainers do to help these trainees? Go back to what we know makes a really good trainer, and we do. We we got uh, about fifteen years ago all the silver scalpels together those who've won a silver scalpel for being the best trainer surgically in the country to work out what it was we, we thought there may be personality traits or something like that. no those, those are different personalities uh but but there were a set of themes they all did similar things like number one they were all batting for their trainees they were king makers, not kings. So they were absolutely brilliant at that. They were people who got in early. They recognized early that somebody was struggling, sorted out what it was and helped support them out of it. So I think probably when it comes to trainees with additional needs, it's recognizing early, hearing even very faint alarm bells and doing something. Because what most trainers do is they talk a good talk, mm, and then I had that look on my face so they knew. Well, no, they didn't. So it's saying early, asking questions early, finding out early, intervening early, getting to ST8 and knowing that a trainee is not suitable is not going to do, is not willing to make the sacrifices and not willing to do whatever it is that should have been picked up way, way before. That trainee's been let down to get six years into the surgical the training. The whole system's been let down. And we, we do need to go back and look at what happened. Was it a problem with selection? Was it a problem with something in the context? Their personal circumstances changing? There's a myriad of different uh, different reasons. Um, and we need to really be careful to minimise that because it's expensive if we put... But we are, we are quite avoidant, aren't we, of that kind of conflict, that kind of direct conversation. That we, we, conversation. As a, as we 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 Everyone don't, we don't is. like it. That's hu humans. Humans don't like conflict. That's, that's just taken as read. But if we can start to reframe conflict and think about... Um, at conflict around tasks, things, processes, that's fine. Relation, relational conflict, conflict between people is difficult. But if we can separate them out, conflict is not just inevitable, it's absolutely essential to make any progress doing anything. Yeah. If we all sit in echo chambers congratulating each other on how great things are at the moment, thank you, nothing will change. So, so I guess the earlier step is identifying that trainee mm -hmm. because a lot of people will just pass sign them off and say okay the next guy will sort it out the next girl yeah. will sort it out yeah that's you know? exactly what happens and i i 
watched a really interesting situation unfold where a, a trainee was in huge trouble and everybody knew. And I went in, in one month to three separate functions and heard three separate groups of people talking about the trainee. And this was a trainee far down in their training, mm. but nobody had had the conversation about actually what you are doing now means that you will not be appointable as a colleague. Understood. Yeah. So, so we've got to, so in terms of actionable steps that people listening, the trainers listening can take, one is to obviously identify the training with additional needs early to, I assume, have a conversation with their educational supervisor or training program, resident I, program I, director. The, the problem is you've got to be careful you don't start a little ganging up. Oh, have you seen him and what he does? Oh, yes, I found a little bit of that too. Mm. Because then before you know it, this poor person's been isolated and everybody loves a good gang up. They do. Mm. Yeah. So it's listening for those alarm bells early and having a conversation really early don't put it off don't assume it will get better and my feeling is some somebody once said to me flood them with assessment and actually i think that's right you flood them with assessment which bit is it you're worried about is it skills is it professional capabilities is it knowledge whatever it is identify and then flood with assessment the worst that can happen is they'll say i feel picked on and you just say my job is to help you be good enough, certainly, but the very best you can be. And the way to do that is to spend time with you and assess you. Helping our trainees to manage uncertainty and difficulty and not being quite sure what's going to happen. That's our job as yeah. trainers. Not to. Rev My feeling is that we have, I have two direct conversations with a trainee with some candor and some kindness. And if things are still a problem after two of those conversations, then I will go to the next person, whether it's the supervisor, training program director, head of school. But I have two direct conversations before I involve anybody else. And, and, and document every discussion. Uh, actually, I will often get the trainee to document that discussion. Mm. I, I tend not to keep a, 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 a diary. So if it were you and you were a trainee who I thought might be struggling and it was a particular area, I will say, right, let's spend some time. Let's have a discussion. I want you to capture that discussion and all the feedback we've discussed in a reflective CBD. I don't care what it's about, whether it's managing a list or managing punctuality or whatever it's about, you capture it in a reflective CBD because I need to know that you've got it. And that shows you their level of insight as well. Absolutely. And, and if you don't do that and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, fine and I don't get it, then I'll be, I'll email and WhatsApp, where, where is it? Because we've had that discussion and you were, oh yes, yes, it, it's coming, it's coming. Mm. I have two of those. And then if it doesn't come, I will uh, write a paragraph and uh, send it to the trainee, but also with their supervisor copied in. Okay, nice. The, the other concept um, is, the concept Pete and I were talking about, this concept of the trainer in difficulty. So the thing that doesn't get talked about a lot um, something that Nigel Stanfield kind of raised with me was that actually a lot of trainers let down their trainees. And so there are some train, you know, trainees who will come and say, I don't really get to operate in, I don't get to operate very much at all. The clinics are very much functional just to get through them. There's no kind of learning or feedback. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really, you know, uh, they're not doing my assessments. There's not, I'm not really getting much out of this job. So there is this thing of the trainer in difficulty. Yeah, there is. And, and people sort of know who those are. And one of the things that Nigel did was to try to address that. And that, of course, is where the 80 work-based assessments came from. That wasn't about getting trainees to jump through hoops. That was a real attempt to try and get trainers to engage. Now, we have that information. There's, there's different systems all over the world, but the principle is the same, whether you are in Saudi Arabia, San Antonio or Sydney having some kind of record of feedback, whether it's held electronically or on bits of paper, or as an, uh, an audio note, that's the most important thing. And trainers will either have evidence of that or they won't. And you could say, oh, well, no, but, but she or he is a really good trainer. They just don't like ISCP. Well, 
That's like saying, oh, yeah, I, they're a really good surgeon, but they just don't like operating. That's it's it's part of the whole deal is recording, having feedback conversations and recording them. So I presume, well, that's what should be happening everywhere in the world. And in this country, it definitely happens. Mm -hmm. So we can go into our electronic uh, portfolios now and you will be able to see who engages and who doesn't but as a program director like cash you will have trainees coming to your to your yearly assessment their yearly mm. assessment saying the job i just did is woefully inadequate yeah. i'm not i'm not getting trained this this yeah. trainer isn't isn't I, I don't feel the last six months were worthwhile what what, what does cash do in that situation you, you, the, the thing is you are taking one person's point of view why weren't they having opportunities was it because they weren't prepared was it because they weren't they couldn't be trusted to do even the basic stuff so you you've th these that's why i struggle a bit with all this anonymous feedback going through surveys here there and everywhere all you end up with is some comments and you think oh gosh where does that come from what what does it mean now maybe it goes back to having these trusted and respected respected conversations and it might be that we should do less trainer development events and faculty development uh things and then training programs maybe we should be meeting all together fairly frequently to decide how we want our programs to run so your program at uh Parts in the Royal London, having trainees, whatever level they are, doesn't matter what level they are, but to agree what it is you are going to do together. And certainly from the point that you make, Pete, there's a bit of unpicking to do because it could be the trainee, it could be the of course. trainer. Or the combination but, of the two. But once you've been a, once you've been doing these for a few years, you, you you get to see a pattern if it is the trainer. You'll exactly. See uh, and then and then you know, uh, someone you know the the hardballer, someone like Nigel Stanfield would say, right, pull the trainee, and that's not always you know take the trainee away from the trainer, and that's not always logistically practical, but uh, you know that's certainly an option. But but Cash also that's not probably desirable. No. That's a bit like you know when 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 we. In the past, we watched parents take children out of school because it wasn't going so well, going into another one and then finding difficulties there too. Now, real life, we are going to have difficulties with people. There's going to be conflict with people. There's going to be tough times. And learning how to manage that supported is going to be really important. And that, you know, when we when we think about the the all the anti-bullying stuff at the minute, I'm absolutely with that. And some of the things that have gone on in the past are absolutely horrendous. But we've also got to be really careful that the pendulum doesn't swing so much the other way that nobody has difficult conversations because trainees with additional needs will hide behind those screens if you like so i think that's making it extra difficult at the moment can i ask you about um imposter syndrome imposter phenomenon because all of us are rooted in insecurities about our professional acceptance and you know do is this you know it's only a matter of, i keep saying it's only a matter of time before we get found out um i, keep, I think that happened a long time ago <laughs> and the thing is everyone is affected by this imposter syndrome imposter phenomenon whatever you call it in a different way even the great pete bates gets it is that fair it's true i, I get it all the time I, I every time i come to a podcast or I, was, I was talking to lisa earlier on and we were talking about various bits and i i, I, so I you, you were recording some extra pieces of lisa that be available for everyone to see we'll try and link to them up there <laughs> where, where? Little pig's flying there. <laughs> Pete didn't get the reference the first time I talked about this. Yeah. So even you get this, Pete. I absolutely get it. Whenever I do a lecture, whenever any of these things, I'm always honoured to be asked. Now I always have a feeling of like I've, I've I've got to prove my worth. I've got to, I've got to you know show everyone why it was worthwhile asking me to do this. So Lisa, what are your thoughts on that as a professional? I hadn't come across it until about 20 years ago when I was in a group of 12 cardiothoracic surgeons doing something. And, and one of them suddenly went, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. Oh gosh, no, I just, I'm sorry. I'm just not clever enough. It's all out now. And I thought, oh. And then all other 11 went, oh, 
I get that too. Is it? Oh, it's not just me. Oh, thank heavens. And I thought, actually, yeah, me too. So I went to find out about it. And in those days, it was called Achilles syndrome. Then changed to this imposter syndrome. But now the feeling is that it's not a problem. It's not a syndrome. It's probably an essential part of being amazing and brilliant. And actually, it's the sort of motivational fuel, if you like. So it's now being referred to as the imposter experience. Uh, there's been a lot of talk associating um, imposter experience with women for various reasons. But of course, it's not just women. And as I said, it looks as though it's not just part and parcel, but it's part of the reason people get to be really good. And those those moments of, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not good enough, pushes people to strive to be better so maybe what we've got to do is to just recognize it for what it is and go oh that's what's happening but that's okay right come on how am I going to stop feeling like this I'm going to prepare more I'm going to do more on this or I'm going to make my bit stronger on on this so stop with the syndrome oh it's a problem so you're suggesting that actually that there's some value to having a bit of this oh yeah I do a absolutely bit of, bit of fight or flight type thing yeah, just a, just a, a bit of a bit of momentum. As long as it isn't crippling and doesn't get in the way of, of leading a, a reasonable life, recognizing it. Oh, there's a little bit of imposter coming in there. That's fine. That's what it is. And then refocus on what I'm going to do to feel differently. I must say, I, I've become too um, aware that it is more widespread than I had realised. I thought it was just me. <laughs> we all thought it was just us. And, 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 and how ridiculous is that? What does that say? It says we don't talk about some of the things that really bother us and we really find difficult. And so we are going to have to have some of those hard conversations. But, but that's not the classic orthopaedic or surgical way. Is, is there a classic orthopaedic surgical way? Is there one? It certainly, it, well, it used it used to be all about brawn and about self confidence and machismo, machismo, being a super coper, being a super coper. You know, saying I t I can take everything on and do it. Wouldn't yeah, it, it yeah, was yeah. Very much that. Absolutely. Well, was it or was that what what was loudest to us? Anyway, whatever it was in the past, now we've got a fabulous mix of different people, genders, types of people nationalities oh j just different everything and a and, much, and, much and, a, and a preparedness to speak and uh and be more vocal and and say how you feel rather than uh a, a sense that one one has to just uh toe the line yeah we we wondered whether there might be a surgical personality because there's been a lot of work done on surgical personalities and you lots of you still talk about type a personalities when we did quite a lot of work with spine surgeons and we looked at ways of categorizing personality and there there wasn't there, it was lots and lots of different types we hear about the very extrovert types because they're often involved in education or in types of performance the more introvert people are getting on with the job well yeah. there's more stories and more kind of legend about the extrovert types is there yeah for sure i mean they're the ones who are out um, on stage they're the one who are kind of booming the loudest they're the know. ones who talk loudly but yeah. bear in mind that people like Obama actually very introvert well he's had quite a lot to say for himself that has been incredibly valuable so it's just that maybe we've heard from the uh, uh, the loud extrovert ones and there's a place for that but there needs to be a balance is Obama a spine surgeon <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, he could do anything he likes. Uh, tell me, uh, w women, and you say women have imposter syndrome phenomenon experience more. Why? Well, Why? Well, no, no, we we don't know that they have that more. Okay. We tend to hear about it more, and maybe so women talk I mean, about, it about it more. It yeah, more. yeah. yeah. It's, so it may not be that it happens more, but certainly what we do know about um, uh, women in surgery and actually women in, in, in any high performing professions is that men tend to be assumed to be capable, whereas women in the same position have to prove it. And that has come up time and again across many, many different cultures. This is before anyone's even picked up a scalpel. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
So it's it's it is you can see why uh, that that might uh, put women in a more vulnerable position. Just because they feel more heavily scrutinised right off the bat. They are more heavily scrutinised, I think, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's not that sure. they feel that, they are. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? These these feelings of inadequacy, of, of, of worthiness, they kind of change, don't they, throughout your career? Uh, they, ch- they change flavour. So when you're when you're a medical student, you're wowed by everything, and you really don't feel worthy because you don't have all the all the knowledge yet. And then when you're a, a junior, you're not consultant, part of the community, really. You're not part of that community of practice. No, that's right. And then you become a junior re- a registrar, but you feel that there's this whole world above you that you you <clears throat> that you aspire to be in, but you're not in yet. And then when you're a junior consultant or junior attending, uh, still. You, you, you're almost struggling for the acceptance of the of the older guard. But weirdly, once you become the older guard, suddenly you look down and you see these young whippersnappers coming up with their new ideas and new technologies and vigour and excitement. And, and there's part of you that feels threatened by that and feels slightly inadequate again. And it's, it's a, I think imposter syndrome carries on all the way through that kind of nagging, that nagging, gnawing feeling that you're not quite up to it. Uh, but it just changes the way it manifests itself, and, and th- there will there will always be be parts of that. So we know that um, cognitive capabilities start to decay as you get older. Certainly, physical. I mean, you're way beyond your physical peak, you two. I'm what? Afraid. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. What? It's, it's still to come, Lisa. It's still to come. <laughs> no, it's, I'm afraid. I'm afraid you it's might a, have missed it's a, it. It's a hot, hot body summer coming I up. I can still just <laughs> about do four, ten press ups. Just can about. you? No, yeah. that's very impressive. That'll yeah. come in handy against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> the, but that's the bottom line you lose physical strength you you, you know your cognitive processing abilities uh, start to decay and that but there'll be life experiences different things that you have to offer so you said earlier we were talking and you said learning how to reinvent yourself and the contribution you make to whatever community you're in is really important but don't think you don't think that there comes a oh no there may be a point at which you just think oh right i'm i'm on this i know my stuff and everyone's listening to me and it lasts about 10 seconds and then oh you're going down the other side yeah yeah well i I think you're only you're only as good as as your last event or talk or or you know your uh, it, it, it's, it's very it's very easy to lose your edge if you're if you're complacent it may also be about how you, you know we talked a bit about identity early if you identify yourself as the job you do so i am a trauma surgeon in a unit here or i am head of department or i am tpd if it's quite difficult to take your ladder down from that building and put it up against another one but we probably have to do that all the way through our lives. Um, I thought you were about to use a football analogy. Then. <laughs> You're going to be good as your last game, you know. I take it. What, well, that's right. That, that, that's, I just take yeah, it one webinar right. at a time. <laughs> <laughs> How do consultants stay stay current? How do attendings uh, stay current? Uh, so people who are in this established positions and don't necessarily have to be proving themselves to yeah. stay in that position how do they stay current I, I i think that's a really interesting one i can only really talk about what i do um and i have appointed or invited three um more younger people to help me so their job is to keep me from going over the hill and becoming one of those oh in my day it was all fine and to stay what what's really mattering at the moment what's happening what breaking news is there um so i have a foundation doc a core trainee and a less than full-time st5 who are all absolutely brilliant and they keep me on the straight they're part of a brain trust yeah yes (laughs) they are oh now he's showing off there say it again no, no, it's just I got actually that's from Scrubs. There was a oh, brain trust it? in Scrubs where it was basically the janitor and the lawyer used to play the drums. Was, uh, <laughs> I'll put a photo up there. Yes, a bit of, so it's not a clever educational or you know academic thing I'm claiming. It's from a TV program. <laughs>
Yeah, no, well done. That's <laughs> that's, that's lovely, Cash. Um, <laughs> it is something about staying grounded. There is a temptation for all of us to do professional development things that are around stuff we really like we're really interested in we're already proven in that so i suspect you'll go to bask i'll go to educator things but actually we need to be developing in the areas we need not just the bits we fancy you talk about a challenge network you have a social network which is the people around yeah. you and the people you're communicating with yeah. but then there's a challenge network and yeah. these are the people who are questioning what you're doing who are yeah. uh, uh, making you reflect upon your practice yeah uh, so i think that's really important now and i think i've made the mistake over the years of having an idea working something up feeling really passionate about it finding other people to agree with me and say yeah that's an amazing idea well done and then actually it all goes wrong because nobody's noticed the massive crack down the middle that actually people did notice, not me, but they did, but didn't say anything because they didn't want to undermine me. So now, before I invest a huge amount of time and effort in anything, I will put together my idea and I'll find someone I know I can trust to give me some good feedback. And I don't just say, will you give me feedback? Because then they'll be kind often i'll say i want you to kick holes in this i need to know whether i spend any more time on this so kick holes in it that is your job yeah so we 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 spend waste a lot of our time in echo chambers and the same thing happens on twitter we we you know with people we agree with yeah 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 honestly isn't that terrible mm -mm. instead of thinking why has the person said this and what is there in that that might be important, that I might have learned something from. And actually, I need to change my mind. We don't do that enough. Very clever people, once they uh, have a point of view, find it very difficult to change their mind. And that can be a problem. That can be a massive problem because that's when you get in your uh, echo chamber and, and make terrible mistakes. So, you, uh, feedback. You've listened to our podcast. You've seen some of the ODMs that come in. Oh, my any... God. Here we go. I don't want to ask this, but have you got any feedback for us? <laughs> Sincerely. I, I, I absolutely love them. Um, I wonder whether... Um... Well, in fact, let me ask you first. If you were to make one change, what would it be? And what are you most proud of? Um... Gosh, if I, what am I most proud of? I think I'm just proud of um, the fact that people are engaging and we're getting uh, a wide, wide range of communities really engaging from, you know, doctors and surgeons of all um, grades, plus medical students, plus allied health professionals. That's probably the thing I'm most proud of. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. It's it's, it's amazing to 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 have, to be reaching out to this 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 number of people. So if that matters to you, and it's the numbers and the breadth of people, how can you increase that even further? That's that's one question that we could talk about when it comes to feedback. And the the thing about what's the one thing that you need to sort? We need to sort the sound out. So we bought like, we spent like a couple of grand on, on a little <laughs> yeah. grey box. And the other thing I would change is I would get rid of Pete Bates. That's the one thing I would change. Would you? Yeah. Should we, should we sing? Yeah, why not? Well, come on, let's have a song. Oh, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Hash. Happy birthday. You're out of tune. Happy birthday, dear <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Blow your candles out. Um, hey. All over Lisa. Happy birthday, old boy. <laughs> it's like that time I vomited in her dinner. <laughs> and now you just spread all the particles that way. Uh, we, um, we, people will be wondering why, I was why I've been quite nice to you today. I've really held yeah. back. I've bit my tongue a few times. It's because it's your birthday. So um, I'm that... sorry to water you down in that way. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. He's uh... doing so well for 60, though, isn't he? He's doing so well, yeah. <laughs> barely looks a day over. <laughs> um, listen, on that note, I'd like to thank you for coming, Lisa Hadfield Law. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. It's uh, been <laughs> real fun. And you recorded a bunch of videos with Pete this morning, so we'll get those out and we'll link to those. Uh, and Pete, I'll, 
Aren't you supposed to press the subscribe button at this point? Yeah, uh, yeah if you have. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Pete's learning. Pete's Pete, learning. We, get told, be... we get told off by Mike if we don't say. Pete's going to be an influencer, so you have to. <laughs> if you haven't done it already, if you're still here, <laughs> hit the like button, uh, subscribe, and turn notifications. Uh, with that, Pete, I'll I'll see you I'll see you around. See you. <laughs> <laughs>